Hello, everyone. My name is James Henley. I'm the director of RDA Toolkit, and this is uh, today's webinar is the latest in our series of free monthly webinars. Uh, next month, we'll have a webinar on how to um, make a proposal to change RDA uh, that will be led by the past RDA chair, Kathy Glennon. Um, before we jump in today's uh, webinar, just a couple notes. Uh, the chat is disabled, so we will be using the Q&A section, uh, and uh, Elisa will be taking some questions at the end of her presentation. We'll leave plenty of time for um, questions, so just type your questions in there, and uh, we'll get to them. That said, I would like to turn it over to Elisa C., the Education Orientation Officer for our RDA Steering Committee. Okay, thank you so much, James. Uh, so uh, I have not had a chance to meet all of you, so I will provide a very quick introduction of my background. I am a metadata librarian with the University of Toronto Libraries, where I supervise the cataloging of English language materials. I also have a sessional teaching contract with the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto, where I teach a cataloging course within their library and information science concentration. Prior to joining the Central Library, I was embedded uh, as a librarian within the Faculty of Information, where I was involved for several years in programs committee discussions. So I entered my role on the RSC with some familiarity with the curriculum behind uh, the ALA accredited master's programs. As part of my service work with the university, I serve as a member at large on the Canadian Committee on Cataloging and as the Education and Orientation Officer on the RSC. Now that you have a little bit of background uh, about me, I would be very interested to know who is here today. So if you wish to participate, please take a moment to answer the question that is displayed on the slide in front of you. What is your primary professional role? So for those of you who have never done this before, to answer this question, I am going to ask you to open an internet browser on your device. Go to the website address slido.com, which you should see right here on the left side of the screen. And once you are there, you're going to type in a seven digit code. 9478323. That should bring you into the poll. So I can see that the count is slowly creeping up. Thank you to the 24 participants who have already participated. I'm just going to give you a moment to answer. I know that some of you also fulfill multiple roles like myself, so please feel free to answer more than one uh, response. All right. So this is what it looks like so far. Uh, many of you are here as a practitioner, uh, but we also see many educators, instructors, and course trainers. Okay. All right, number is still moving up. So I'll just give you another 10 seconds before I move on. Okay. Thank you so much for participating in this. This is very helpful for me to know what the demographics is like for this webinar. Um, and it will also give me a sense of some of the feedback that I will receive after this workshop. So here is a quick outline of how we will be spending the next uh, 50 to 55 minutes. So I will briefly talk about my role and tasks as the education and orientation officer. Then I will provide a summary of the report on approaches to teaching RDA in the LIS classroom. Lastly, I will talk about next steps. So that will include talking about a handout for educators and trainers that builds upon the summary findings of my report, as well as ongoing outreach activities. Um, I will mention as well that at the conclusion of this webinar, the slides will be shared on the RDA uh, Steering Committee website. Some of you may have attended the NARDAC virtual forum back in April 2022. If you did, I apologize, there will be a little bit of repetition here. So to give you an overview of what my role entails, as the Education and Orientation Officer, 
I facilitate effective RDA instruction relating to the official RDA toolkit. And I try to encourage and support communities in their transition to the official toolkit. Although this position began as a one-year position that officially started on January 1st, 2022, in anticipation of more communities planning their training, my term was extended for a second year. So it will now end on December 31st, 2023. My tasks include liaising with RSC members and communities as they plan their outreach events, liaising with LIS education communities. So LIS here stands for Library and Information Science. I am also liaising with contacts to help build an informal network of RDA educators and experts. I try to identify opportunities for RDA education and orientation internationally and recommend how to handle them. I am also helping to create instructional materials for RDA contents and to give related presentations. However, I will emphasize that the type of instructional materials refer to general high level interpretations of RDA and not instructional materials that are specific to any one community. My first year on the RSC culminated in writing my report on approaches to teaching RDA in the LIS classroom. The link of that is posted here on the slide. I have also provided a shortened link for those of you who have not had a chance to click through to the link before. So I'll just pause for a moment to give you a chance to jot down this URL. So I presented this report to the RSC back in October 2022 at its quarterly business meeting, where members included regional representatives. The report was then soft published in November 2022. So I'm just going to ask a very quick demographics question again. And here I'm going to ask you, if you have had a chance to look at this report yet coming into this webinar. So I'm gonna pause for a moment. Again, please bring yourself to the web address slido.com, input the seven digit code that you see on the bottom left corner of the slide. And I would just pause for a moment to get some responses. Okay. So it looks like uh, many of you have not had a chance yet to read this report, which is okay. I know many of us are very busy juggling multiple uh, responsibilities. So the next portion of this presentation, I'm going to give you a summary of the main sections of the report. So I'll begin by talking about my methodology. As you will know from the webinar description, my report was informed by a series of informal in-person interviews that I conducted over Zoom uh, with those who are involved in education or training. The methodology I use for interviews is described in the introduction of my report. The interviews that are accounted for within my report were conducted from October 2021, when I began my RSC work in an elect capacity, all the way up to mid-September 2022. Although I continued to schedule and hold interviews after mid-September 2022, I did not have a chance to incorporate those findings into my report. Instead, what I will do is I will factor those findings from the later interviews into next steps, which I will talk about towards the end of this webinar. In the report, I did not identify specific interviewees or specific regions, but I do share that generally, the majority of interviewees were educators teaching in an LIS program affiliated with a university, college, or vocational school program. The LIS programs were spread across Oceania, Europe, and North America. However, I do want to acknowledge that the majority of those who spoke with me reside in North America. Some of the interviewees identified primarily as scholars because they have not worked directly with metadata creation or cataloging in recent years. 
Some identified primarily as practitioners because their primary work appointment is as a practitioner. Their teaching contract is as an adjunct faculty member or as a sessional instructor. I also spoke with a few supervisors with training experience. I employed various modes of outreach to establish contacts. So as a starting point, each of the active regional RSC members generously connected me to their existing contacts. Some of the RSC regional representatives were already involved in teaching or they had connections to current instructors. I also invited word of mouth recommendations and email referrals from those that I interviewed. I made cold contacts, looking up LIS program websites, searching for faculty members listed on program directories and emailing them directly. In a couple of cases, I also established initial contact through social media channels. In terms of the interviews themselves, those were conducted over a Zoom call that lasted anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour. Some were one-on-one -on -one calls, while others were group calls. I left it up to the prospective interviewees to determine if they wanted to invite colleagues into a group call or if they preferred to speak with me on an individual basis. While I prepared a list of questions to help guide the interview, some conversations developed organically. When it was not possible to schedule a Zoom call, I sent my list of questions to the interviewee who would return their written responses to me by email. I will also just say that not everyone that I contacted responded to my invitation. Now I will talk about recurring themes. Many of the interviewees uh, talked about the following themes. How do I teach foundational concepts and terminology found in the official RDA toolkits? How do I adapt to the new navigation of the RDA toolkits? And how do I provide a linear sequence or narrative to teaching RDA? There were also two themes discussed in some of our conversations, but I uh, identified them as out of scope of this report. So a number of conversations turned to the challenges of incorporating cataloging courses into an information science curriculum, as well as the difficulties of resourcing LIS courses. Despite the importance that programs might lend to data science or data studies uh, programs. So although these are complex issues shared by multiple countries and regions, they are beyond what I have been tasked to comment on. So I excluded them from my report. Here are some points that I have learned from the interviews. Teaching foundational concepts and terms remains important to most educators. Most, if not all, of the interviewees that I spoke with incorporated aspects of theory and practice into their courses, even if the balance of theory and practice might vary from instructor to instructor. Most are teaching RDA, but not necessarily with the most current version of RDA. So most are still using the original RDA toolkit, while a few have moved on to the official RDA toolkit. Most express curiosity about the official RDA toolkits, but are waiting to see what happens with implementation. Those who are incorporating official RDA toolkit into their courses are also teaching theory and principles. So for example, the IFLA Library Reference Model, or LRM. They recognize the significance of RDA for linked data discussions. Many of my interviewees expressed uncertainty about navigation. They acknowledged that to adopt the official RDA toolkit, they would need to adapt to new ways of navigating, referencing, and citing instructions for students. As an instructor myself, I am empathetic to this point. With the official RDA toolkit, what I have found helpful when teaching is to show students how to use the toolkit as a tool effectively. So this could include showing students how to search for instructions in the toolkit, how to reference specific elements, and how to generate bookmarks, unique URLs for pages or specific passages within pages. And for those who teach with a lot of paper handouts and physical workbooks, showing students uh, how to generate citation numbers. 
So although I have not personally done so, I know that some instructors also choose to create local documents within the RDA toolkit to guide students through a workflow. If instructors do so, it is useful to show students how to navigate to those documents. So I'm just going to take a very quick foray into the RDA toolkit at this point to show you what I was just talking about. So uh, within the RDA toolkit, if you open any specific element or entity page, uh, each page always has a unique URL. And that will also be listed at the very bottom of the page. So right here. And if you are an instructor who produces a lot of paper handouts, you might find it cumbersome to refer to this entire URL link. So instead, what you can do is you can highlight a specific passage that you want to reference to students. And you'll notice that when I highlight a passage, a little pop-up window shows up. You can use this pop-up window to either generate a citation number. So click on this. Um, hash symbol. Oh, I'm going to try that again. So normally this works really well, but I think it might be because I had this page preloaded. All right, there you go. So this citation number, you can copy and paste it into the handouts that you create and distribute to your students. And what your students can do is they can then copy the string of numbers and then place it into the search box, and they will come back to that specific passage that was highlighted. So this is very handy. For those of you who teach in an online environment, as um, I do <laughs> sometimes, you can actually create a hot link to a specific passage. So I just highlight it. This pop-up window shows up. I clicked on the Create Link button, copy. And then you paste this into whatever platform you use to distribute information. OK, I'm going to jump back into my uh, presentation slides now. Now, in several interviews, educators expressed wanting to see a more linear, narrative-based approach to teaching with the official toolkits. So with the original toolkit, they tended to rely on the arrangement of numbered chapters to approximate a framework for teaching, but the official toolkit doesn't follow a linear organization. So although there isn't a predetermined sequence of instructions in the official toolkits, we can use guidance chapters uh, to help scaffold learning for students. There's no prescribed order to how the guidance chapters should be read in the official toolkits, except to start with the following. Introduction to RDA, objectives and principles governing RDA, standards related to RDA, and data elements. The nice thing is that all four of these uh, chapters are listed at the very top of the guidance menu. Now, in my report, I also present a proposed order of guidance chapters that can be assigned to novice learners. The order presented in the report is based on the courses that Mei Chan, Head of Metadata Services at the University of Toronto, and I have taught together. The order that is presented in the report is meant to serve as an example and is not intended to be prescriptive. Communities may differ on the order of guidance chapters to read, based on their own preferences and priorities. So at this point, I'm going to briefly jump out again and uh, show you what that looks like in the report. So this is the report that I presented to the RSC. And you'll notice that there is a section called Role of Guidance Chapters. So this begins on page five, and it runs down to page six. And if you sort of go halfway down page six, you will see this um, proposed order of assigning guidance chapters to students to review. So again, this order is very specific to the experience that my co-instructor and I have had teaching in a uh, defined environment that we are most familiar with. So some of these guidance chapters might not apply to the environment within which you teach, but I have offered it as a starting point to help you think about how you might frame your own teaching.
All right, so now I'm going to take a moment to share with you some tips on teaching with RDA. And many of these tips are derived again from my experience co-teaching with Mei Chan on courses related to RDA. These tips are also presented in the report. So first of all, it's good to teach students how to read entity pages and element pages. As you may have already noticed, the text in RDA can be very technical, precise, and challenging for novices. Showing students that there is a consistent structure to an entity page and an element page can provide a cognitive framework for their learning. It can be very helpful to students to know that pages are structured to point out precisely when a cataloging decision needs to be made. So for example, if we were to look at um, the statement of responsibility page, so this is an example of an element page in the toolkits, you might want to point out to students certain key sections. So aside from the breadcrumb trail at the top and the official element reference label also at the top of the page, you want to emphasize to them that they should read through the definition and scope because the definition and scope will tell the cataloger if the element they are looking for is really the element that they need. You probably also want to show them the element reference card. So for some setups, you might not have the card already expanded you can just click on it to open it up. This card is useful because it gives you alternate labels that students might be more familiar with in other contexts or that you might have seen in other contexts. And it also provides, if available, mappings to other ontologies. So here, for example, um, I often teach in a Mark 21 bibliographic environment. So I would refer students to this mapping. There is also the pre-recording section that is very helpful for students to go through because it gives additional context. It helps catalogers make a decision um, to determine if this is really the element they want to go for, or if there is a related element that they should look at instead. It is also helpful to show students how to read the conditions and options. So one interviewee that I spoke with emphasized that when they teach, they tend to read passages of text aloud in front of students. This allows them to demonstrate how to parse out the meaning of different instructions found on the page. Another tip is to know which concepts will require greater interaction with students and greater support from you, the instructor. From my own experience, I have found that students struggle with understanding entity boundaries, identifying instances of work, expression, manifestation, and item until they are presented with a variety of examples. Technical definitions of nomen, nomen string, and appellations are also better understood through examples. Although it might seem straightforward, it is actually very important to explain the distinction between each of the four recording methods that are permitted in RDA and to provide examples of each of those recording methods so that students can see the difference between an unstructured description versus a structured description or an identifier versus an IRI. Demonstrating how RDA can be applied requires a data environment to be defined. Defining the environment in which students will create metadata description sets is also strategic because it is being mindful of students' cognitive load. The RDA toolkit includes a guidance chapter on RDA implementation scenarios, which explains at a fairly high level the different ways in which RDA data might be used. For data that is recorded using structured description as the recording method, you might need to demonstrate to students how to apply the vocabulary encoding scheme that applies to a particular element, or you might need to show students how to construct access points um, if access point construction is part of uh, the environment within which you catalog. So this might also entail showing students where to go to look for relevant string encoding schemes. The data environment that you define for students 
can mimic current local metadata structures. So if you typically incorporate practice into your classes, you can ask students to record values for your local environment. For example, I am based in a Canadian academic library setting where English happens to be the primary language of operation. So in the courses that I have co-taught, my co-instructor and I have tended to ask students to catalog in English and to prepare students to record values that could eventually be mapped to the Mark 21 format for bibliographic data. But we also show students that Mark 21 is not the only encoding uh, method possible. And we also show students how to find RDA instructions in other languages in the toolkit. But again, this is very specific to the environment within which I work. Along the same lines, creating a course-based application profile can help students to guide um, their learning. So instead of overwhelming students with thousands of possible elements, you shape their focus by defining the elements for which you want them to record values. An application profile is simply a specification of what to record in a metadata description set and how to record that data. The application profile can be as simple as a template saved to a spreadsheet or a document file. The application profile would define elements that students should record, indicate which elements can be repeated in a metadata description set. For each element, indicate the recording method that you want students to apply, indicate which transcription guidelines should be followed, and if applicable, specify the vocabularies, policies, and or guidance documents that you want students to follow being sure to distinguish when an instruction is RDA instruction versus a local policy. Some of you may recall that Melissa Parent, a representative from the ORDAC um, Regional Committee, provided an excellent primer on RDA application profiles last year. I have provided the link to um, the blog post summarizing that presentation on the slide in front of you. Um, so, it looks something like this. So this blog post will link you out to her presentation if you want to see a refresher. Um, and it also will show you an example of an application profile being developed. Okay, another tip for educators is to create documents for students that would supplement their use of RDA toolkits. When preparing these documents or adapting documents that are created by other instructors or trainers, know that digital documents can include embedded links to pages of RDA toolkits or even to specific passages within the page. So a moment ago, I had demonstrated to you how you might create those uh, hot links. Long URLs are less practical to uh, recreate on a printed document. So you can include citation numbers instead in lieu of the embedded links. Documents can also be hosted on the RDA toolkit document space with access either to local documents or globally accessible documents. If you go this route, you would have to show students how to subscribe to documents within the toolkit. Um, I should mention as well that for any of you who might be interested in looking at samples of application profiles uh, distributed in a teaching context, um, I'm happy to share with you a version that was used in some of the courses that I co-taught, uh, but you would need to email me. So my email address will be shared at the end of the set of slides. As part of the interviews, I also asked interviewees about types of supports that they would find helpful as an educator. So I'm going to provide for you a summary of what I heard. Uh, interviewees talked about um, how important it would be for them to be able to consult practitioners and experts who have already used the official RDA toolkits. So that led me to the realization that real regional networks are really important. Regional networks um, where educators can readily consult with local practitioners and local experts is definitely a need. 
instructors told me that not knowing how to proceed with RDA toolkits, not knowing who they can ask when they have questions, um, can stall their decision as to whether or not they will adopt the official RDA toolkit. Some educators asked specifically for opportunities related to training and practice, preferably geared towards educators and trainers who are not regular practitioners of cataloging. They felt that it was important to have some practice with the official toolkit before they started teaching it to their students. Instructors asked about samples of application profiles, samples of guidance documents, or other templates that might be used for teaching purposes. Uh, so they wanted to see files that they could potentially adapt for reuse. Um, so with permission from my co-instructor, I was able to share an application profile with some of my interviewees. Um, but when I shared the application profile, I also emphasized that this is just an example, and it was very specific to the environment that I was teaching in. Some instructors that I spoke with mentioned that textbooks and workbooks are an essential part of their teaching activities, especially because textbooks and workbooks often have built-in exercises. Um, so that is information that I have relayed to my colleagues on the RSC. Instructors also mentioned that they value handbooks that break down instructions in a very practical way for educators who are no longer actively uh, practicing as catalogers and who might not be as tuned in to professional discussions. So all of these supports are information that I have passed along to the RSC. Now I'm going to talk about next steps. So what is the current status of this work that I am engaging in on behalf of RSC? Although I have reached out to regions represented by NARDAC, the North American Regional uh, RDA Steering Committee, URIG, which represents European um, committees, and ORDAC, which represents Oceania, many of the educators that I spoke with represented um, in the first round of interviews come from North America. We want to internationalize the topic of training and provide something for educators across different regions to respond to and potentially adapt to their own requirements. So we want to uh, introduce ways to help instructors across different regions to incorporate um, training tips into whatever they develop for their own region. So one direct follow-up that arose from my presentation of this report um, was the recommendation to develop a handout for educators and trainers. So this was actually a suggestion that came from members, other members of the RSC during our October 2022 meeting. Regional RSC committees recognize the importance that training will have um, over the next year. And the RSC agreed that as a whole, there would be value in developing something um, that individual regions or communities can refer to, adapt, and enhance for their own education or training needs. The goal of the handout will be to make it available on the RSC website as a general resource. The intent is also to ensure that it can be international in scope with the potential to be translated into other languages or generalized enough as to leave room for local policies to be determined by individual communities. So to that end, I have one last poll for you. I will be asking you the question, what would help you as an educator or trainer? So before I show you that poll, I just want to mention that um, in this case, I'm not going to be displaying the live responses, but I will be collecting your feedback and I will be relaying the feedback back to my colleagues on the RSC. So please take a moment to go to slido.com again and input the same seven digit code that you see on the bottom left portion of the slide. And this poll is an open-ended question. So you can type in as many times as you would like any kind of suggestions that you have 
that we should consider incorporating into a general handout for educators and trainers. I'm just gonna pause for a moment to give you all a chance to participate if you wish. And for those of you who are not actively typing into this poll, uh, please be assured that the answers are anonymized. Um, so if that helps you to be more expressive in your commentary, please feel free to participate in the poll. So I'll give you another minute to type. I know that some of you may consider this poll to be not the most meaningful way to uh, provide feedback. So at the end of the slide deck, I will be showing you my email address as well. So if you want to provide more detailed inputs, I invite you to email me after this webinar. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this poll going, but I am going to progress to the next slide. The second thing that I will be doing over the next few months is continue outreach to educators and trainers. I am very interested in establishing new connections, especially in regions that are less well represented from the first round of interviews. Where there are few to no formally established library and information science education program affiliated with a university or college, I am interested in identifying trainers who might be willing to chat with me. So if you have connections, I welcome your suggestions. Please email me. I also hope to reconnect with some educators that I met during my first round of interviews to hear about their ongoing experience with RDA. I will also be taking into account the feedback that I heard during the interviews held from September 2022 until now, as well as newly scheduled interviews when I am developing the handout for educators and trainers. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, here is my email address as promised. Please reach out to me if you have tips or ideas about teaching with RDA that you would like to share, or if you have suggestions for things that we should incorporate into that RDA handout for educators and trainers. Um, I think that we have some time for questions as well. So I will, um, should I just open the Q&A panel at this point, James, or? Um, sure, I have it open. I can kind of reference sure. um, Great. it for you. Uh, one is a couple uh, comments we've gotten. Um, one on the very first Slido poll, someone wanted to participate but didn't get the code oh, for it. Okay. If you, um, I mean, I'll post these slides later. I guess the codes are in the slides if they're still active. Um, the polls, uh, and then a couple people um, said that the poll that you just conducted, excuse me, closed before they could uh, finish oh. entering their information. Okay, my apologies for that. I will keep the slide open at this point. I think that should reopen the poll. Um, and if not, please know that I welcome your email as well. So contact me. <laughs> okay, I do have a few uh, questions that came up. I'll start at the top. Um, uh, can you go over searching for topics such as translations? Okay, so um, I feel like I need to just preface the, my answers with the fact that I might not be as knowledgeable in all aspects of RDA, um, but I will do my best to respond. So when you log into RDA toolkits, um, if you look for the dark blue menu, um, on the second uh, from the right, you will see um, the name of a language. And in my case, I have English as a default. But if you click on it, you can actually choose between site languages and RDA languages. So these are the languages that have been um, already reviewed and are now actively published to the toolkit. So for example, I know that sometimes in my classes, I have French speakers 
So we can show them how to open up the RDA toolkit to the French language version, which was actually just released with the December 2022 release of the toolkit. Um, usually it takes a little bit of time as well for the content to load. Uh, but you'll see right away, my guidance menu selections have changed to French. Um, um, yeah. So uh, I, I just went, the person who asked about translations was clarifying. She meant um, instructions regarding cataloging translations. Oh, okay. Or search for instructions regarding cataloging instructions. Okay. translations. Okay, thank you. I think that's going to require a slightly more nuanced response then. Um, yes. Yeah. I appreciate you, you showing the toolkit facility. Oh, <laughs> facility no yeah. Um, so first of all, you are going to need a framework for how you are teaching RDA to your class. So are you teaching to an environment that mimics the cataloging environments in your um, region or in your community? If yes, you can consult your contacts in that community to see if they have a suggested application profile that you can work off of. Um, in order to identify potential elements that will help to show that a resource is a translation of a work that um, needs to be described. So I apologize if that seems like a very vague response, but a lot of these decisions will be based on what um, your local community has defined. Uh, All right. Uh, next up is, do you utilize any textbooks in your classes? Okay, that's a very good question as well. Um, I wish I had pulled up my syllabus. Actually, maybe I can just take a quick moment to show you. Um, I'm going to show you the syllabus from last year. Um, if this works, I'll just pull it over to the side. Um, if you're interested in looking at the syllabus after the webinar, please email me and I can send you the actual link where you can see all the different versions of this course uh, syllabi, uh, syllabus. But um, you'll see that my co-instructor and I, we had actually um, assigned various readings from various sources rather than one specific textbook. And we often assigned um, passages from RDA toolkit, specifically entity documents or guidance chapters that we felt would supplement what students were learning in a particular week. So I guess the, the short answer is no, we don't have one dedicated textbook. But yes, we do assign readings from various sources. OK. Um, the next question is, a search of examples in the original toolkit currently returns roughly 10 times more hits than the official RDA toolkit does. An absence of examples in large parts of the new toolkit runs the risk of elements being unused or misused due to a lack of illustrative information. Did the status of examples in the official RDA toolkit form part of the feedback from educators and trainers? Um, yes, so I have definitely heard comments from interviewees wanting to see more examples of how RDA instructions can be applied to particular scenarios. Um, we do have an examples editor who sits on the RDA steering committee, and she always welcomes contributions of examples from the communities. So if you have ones that you would like to propose, um, please do contact the RDA steering committee. Um, I know that there are sometimes challenges to providing examples that can be generalized across um, different implementations of RDA. So if you're finding that there were many more examples in the original toolkit pertaining to a specific element versus what is currently available in the official toolkits, that may be one of the reasons why. But again, if you know of examples that could be very helpful to um, include, please contact the RSC. Um, next question is, in your interviews, as well as in your own teaching, do you or did your interviewees still teach anything at all about AACR2? Yeah, this is always um, an interesting question. And um, 
I will say that the first time I taught the cataloging course, I had tried to show um, AACR2 squeezed into two weeks of a 12 week course <laughs> and then transitioned into what was then the original um, RDA toolkit. Uh, so this was before the official RDA toolkit was released. And I found it extremely challenging to include two standards into the same course, um, even though I had 12 weeks to work with. So at this point, um, and in the last three iterations of this course, uh, my co-instructors and I have typically not taught AECR2. What we have done instead is dedicate a portion to one of the classes to talking about legacy instructions and uh, legacy catalog records. So we would prepare some examples from the library catalog that students access most frequently. So we assumed it was our own institutional catalog or WorldCats. Um, and we pulled up some records that were clearly created according to an earlier standard. And then we had them identify parts of the record that corresponded to, um, say, elements that would have been the result of an AECR2 instruction. And then we talked about what that would look like potentially in an RDA environment. So that was the extent to which we talked about AECR2. Uh, any rec <coughs> excuse me, any recommendations of resources for new trainers like me? Not that me, is a really, but... <laughs> yeah, I understand that. Thank you. Um, that is such a great question, and it has come up a number of times as well. Um, the main resource that I always recommend is um, introducing RDA second edition. Um, so this is the book written by Chris Oliver. And I believe it was published in 2021 to accompany the release of the official RDA toolkits. Um, it is published by ALA Publishing. I believe it is available in both print formats and ebook formats. Um, it's a really good introduction. It will really help to um, break down some of the more challenging terminology and concepts like Nomen. Uh... The next question is regard to the PS, PCC is working on creating training resources. Are you collaborating with them or is this, that a separate process? Yeah, that is such a great question as well. Thank you for asking it. I am not personally involved in that um, initiative under the PCC umbrella, but uh, my co-instructor from last year and the year before, Mei Chan, who is the head of our metadata services department at the University of Toronto, she is actively on that standing committee on training. Um, one of the biggest disconnects that uh, our uh, attendee here finds is understanding that the end product looks, understanding what the end product looks like when using official RDA, other than a mark record, and what kind of systems are using are using these application profiles. I'm not sure if I read that question well. Do you understand? <laughs> yes, I think so. Okay. And thank you for asking this question. Um, yes, I have also heard this commentary before in some of my interviews. We are still in fairly early days. Um, so I am not sure if there are major um, consortia or organizations that have actively implemented the official RDA toolkit as the toolkit version that they use. However, there are communities that are in the process of developing training materials so that it prepares their members for eventual implementation of the official RDA toolkits. So what does our data look like at the end of the day if we refer to official RDA toolkits for our instructions. Um, this is purely based on queries that I have sent to PCC. So I cannot say that this is generalized across all the regions, but um, the response that I have received before is that at this time during training, um, or sorry, during planning around training, the idea is to try to maintain as much of the status quo as possible. So although the way we look up instructions will change, the end results of most of our data will likely look the same. 
So that means that if there are members who catalog within a Mark 21 environment, there might not be significant changes until um, training incorporates <laughs> changes to the way that data will look. All right, the questions keep rolling in. Would it be possible to incorporate slash add the teaching resources in the toolkit? I do not think it is feasible to ex uh, uh, expend all educators to create their own application profile. Yeah, so the handout that um, the RC is interested in developing for educators and trainers is meant to be a very general handout that anyone from any region can potentially adapt to their own needs. So the plan, I believe, is to make that handout available through the RSC website. So one would not necessarily need, um, say, a subscription to the toolkit in order to get to the content. But I hear you on um, the desire to see some application profiles um, that instructors have already developed so that one doesn't have to recreate the wheel. So the thing with application profiles is that that can be very specific to a particular implementation uh, scenario or a particular environment. Um, so I don't know if RSC would be in the position to share a bunch of different application profiles that have been used by instructors for teaching. But I know that there is desire to link out to generalized application profiles. I hope that that answers the question. Um, so I'll just, I'm going through here. Um, Adam Schiff uh, notes that uh, this is referencing the earlier question about examples. Uh, Honor Moody, who is the examples editor for the uh, RDA steering committee will be presenting on examples at the NARDAC uh, forum, which will be online and free in April. That's one of our upcoming uh, webinars. Um, so jumping ahead to me, uh, one, of the, one of the more frustrating aspects of working with RDA is that answers to questions are either overly technical or very vague, like the answer to the earlier question, which was essentially that cataloging translations using RDA depends on local practices. Some places do not have local practices for this in RDA. Mark, yes, RDA, no. Okay. Um, I guess this might be more of a comment than a question, but I will also just mention in the Q&A um, window, I want to thank Kate James for uh, jumping in to respond to, with the element expression, sorry, the expression elements translation of. Um, so that is an example of a potential element that could be worked into an application profile and um, could be an element that a trainer would cite if they are showing um, a cataloger how to describe a translation. Yeah, you know, I'm just going to add to um, the comment that we just read that um, um, it, it is our expectation we see it happening is that national groups such as the Library of Congress and PCC and um, the National Library of Germany, et cetera, are creating these um, application profiles or set of practices from which um, other more local libraries can um, develop and use for their um, use for their own uh, developing their own pol local policies etc like that and you see that through the policy statements that are already in display in the toolkit um, so what else do we have uh, there's a helpful link posted um, for Patricia regarding the translation. Uh, I believe that's regarding the translation topics again. Um, we have a question. What are the main difficulties encountered in applying the RDA official toolkit for students and which for educators? What aspects of applying RDA official toolkit compared to the original toolkit are considered more difficult? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> 
I think here I'm going to be answering very specifically to my own experience. Um, so I can't say that this can be generalized to other instructors that I've spoken with who are actively teaching with the official RDA toolkits. There are uh, instructors out there who have used the official RDA toolkits. For my own experience, um, let's say I pull up, um, what would be a good example? Okay, I'm gonna show you this element, um, say author person. So usually when I teach, um, I like to start with a very simple kind of resource that most students are likely to have encountered at some point in their academic career. So um, almost all of them, by the time they reach a master's program, will have looked at a monograph or a book. And they will have seen a book that has an author person associated with it. So I asked them, oh, how are you going to record a value for this element, author person? Um, and we read through the definition and scope, look at the element reference card. Okay, there's not a lot of pre-recording instructions here, but we're going to see the sentence that at first will look very cryptic to a newcomer because they're going to see, oh, the general recording instruction is record this element as a value of person, colon, appellation of person, or as an IRI. So now we have to pause and I have to explain to them that before you record a value for this element, you actually have to figure out what you're going to call that agent or that person. So first work out what the value is going to be for appellation of person. Once you have worked out that value, you come back to this element author person and you supply that uh, value of appellation of person. So if you want to know, oh, how do I record the value of appellation of person? Um, you go through the same process, read through the definition and scope, you read through the recording instructions. And again, for a novice, this is going to feel a little baffling and it will feel like there are a lot of um, links within links within links that you have to click on. But I promise that after you work through this pattern a few times, it will get a little bit easier. So at this point, you basically have to show students how they come up with a value of a nomen string. So how do they come up with a value that is either going to stand for the name of the person, or if you are in an environment where you typically record values of access points, you're going to show students how to derive or look up the value of access point for person. So now you've gone through two different layers of clicking. So, once you show students how to work out the value of access point for person, we're going to go back. Uh, we now know what we can substitute in as the value of our appellation of person. And then we can go back one more step. And we now know we have our value for this element author person. Um, you can come up with different analogies to help explain this. Um, so one analogy I have used in the past um, in one of the workshops that I taught last year was thinking of it as peeling an onion. So you're sort of peeling back the layers until you get to the actual value that you need. And then you take that value and you pop it back into your starting points. I don't know if that's helpful, but um, that's one of the most difficult things that I have encountered with students. Um, so the next uh, question is, do you have any advice on how to find the equivalent of original RDA instructions in official RDA or confirming that no equivalent exists? Mm -hmm. Updating materials is difficult without mm -hmm. doing so. Yeah, that is such a great question. And um, if you go into the original toolkits, and I believe I have to credit this um, knowledge to um, a colleague from the University of Victoria, um, Laura Dublay. She showed me that you can actually look up old RDA numbers in the new toolkit. So let's say, for example, um, oh, I have to be logged in. Sorry, just give me one moment to log in. Um, oh. OK, so let's say um, 
you know, I'm going to look for something very straightforward. So let's say we're looking up title, title proper. So in the original RDA toolkit, this was identified as a core element, and we have this rule number 2.3.2. .2. So if we go into our official RDA toolkit, in the search box, I'm hoping that this will bring up something. It sometimes does. OK, so I know this will look strange because you're seeing 2.3.2 show up in multiple pages. Um, but if you work through each of these element pages, at least one of them will hopefully um, tell you the information that you're looking for. If you need to confirm, you can also use the element reference card to try and help you um, map to the value that you were uh, hoping to record. I hope that answers the question. Um, sure. So we're kind of at the end of the time. I'm going to give you one more question, and then the other questions will maybe try and catch up with uh, through a blog post or something like that. Um, the last one here is, um, do you also include or encourage use in consultation of uh, Library of Congress program for cooperative cataloging policy statements and MGDs in your courses to augment the instructions in RDA? Yeah, excellent question as well. Um, so uh, this year I'm teaching with a different co-instructor, um, but with both co-instructors that I have worked with, um, we always agreed that it's helpful to show students how to display the LCPCC policy statements specifically for the environment that we catalog in. We do also point out that there are other policy statements available and that there will be more populating the toolkit in the future. Now, we don't actually refer students out to the metadata guidance documents because that is a very large set of instructions and we know that one, the metadata guidance documents are, we're still undergoing testing. So they were probably not close to their final form. Um, but even if they were close to their final form, we didn't want to overwhelm students with a lot of additional documentation outside of the toolkit. The toolkit, figuring out how to navigate it is already a lot. So what we did instead was when we needed to show students instructions around um, string encoding schemes and formulation of access points, we created a short distilled handout that was very example based and we gave that to students. We told them, oh, if you're in this situation, this is generally what you would do to create that string. Of course, when it came to developing exercises for students to practice and actual graded assignments, we had to make sure that we worked through the answer keys first and that our handouts actually helped um, students to uh, complete those exercises and assignments successfully. All right, thank you, Lisa, for an excellent presentation. Obviously, uh, stirred a lot of conversation. Um, we will be posting this recording and the slides um, later today, I hope, or certainly have them up by Monday. Um, and we'll s s try to, I'll share these uh, remaining questions with Elisa and she can address them um, as she sees fit and we'll get those posted as well. Um, just a reminder that uh, these um, uh, webinars are a monthly thing. Uh, we missed, I think, one month because um, of some um, cha personal changes here at D uh, Digital Reference. But um, uh, we're going to get this back on track. And next month, um, there'll be a newsletter going out next week about uh, and a blog post about um, next month's uh, webinar, um, which, again, will feature uh, Kathy Glennon, the past RDA chair, talking about how to make um, proposals to um, to the RSC, and uh, and after that there'll be a NARDAC forum in April. All right, thank you again, Elisa. I really appreciate it, and thank you for all your work and your report. Um, bye bye, everyone. <laughs>